This episode is being shot in one of the most defining moments of any nation across the world. It's a pre-election period and we're talking all about the 2023 general elections mm -hmm. and what to expect. This is State of the Culture brought to you by Izesan Speak Asan, the African language learning app. I'm your host, Justina Angiating, and I never do this alone. I always have my awesome co-host and you know i'm just underselling it in a way i always have these guys beside me now first off i have this one always ready with his hands and yes yeah. he's really close to me right now i don't know who figured out this arrangement it's fine <sighs> Thank that's you. like saying frederick <laughs> you, you go collect plenty today exactly what a word hey thank you well, hey welcome people it's me frederick your social prefect of right. course and to that end yeah nefisat abdrahman yes and for this topic for this episode we have someone an authority on this topic someone who graced us with this you know appearance today thank you so much he is a producer and anchor of situation Af situation reports on silverbirds rhythm 94.7 abuja Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Victor Irele. I hope I got that right because <laughs> we are very particular about pronouncing people's names properly. Mm -hmm. We are here to promote culture, so I can't be fumbling. Please tell me I did that right. I give you 90%. Oh, that's a pass. That's a pass. pass. <laughs> no, no, no. 90%. 90. You pass. That's excellent. Exactly. Where are you coming from? <laughs> you know how they usually say, you know, in Nigerian lectures, how they go, don't worry, oh. take this B. A is for Nobody God. Nobody gets it like <laughs> A is for God. I'm just like, whoa. See, the second question is the first loser. Have you heard that before? Okay, Jesus, I'm learning yeah. that for the yeah, first time. Yeah, it's so terrible. That's but thank you. That's actually, you know, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us again. It's my it? pleasure. Okay. So, like I said, this is, Nigeria is practically pregnant because it's exactly nine months to the general elections. That is when we're shooting this episode. So nine months from now, Nigeria should have its next president mm -hmm. and, you know, other um, members of the, you know, government. government. Exactly. Thank you so much. God, I love that you're here. <laughs> yes. So that is what we're talking about. Now we're talking about the plans leading up to that. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, we have our presidential candidates mm -hmm. lined up. We all know them from the PDP, from the APC from Labour LP, Party. Labour Party, and so on. And we also have, before then, we had the electoral bill signed. It is now an act. Mm -hmm. So first question, there was a push for the signing of this bill, Mr. Victor. Why do you think there was such a push for that bill at first? Anyway, over time, there has been issues with uh, elections. And a lot of persons had recognized the fact that some of the issues had to do with uh, legal frameworks. So they needed to tighten the news, cross all the T's and dot all the I's if we're going to get a credible, transparent and free elections based on the laws. And because of that, a lot of persons agitated and pushed that let there be an amendment to the 2010 Electoral Act. And that was what eventually led to moving for the 2022 electoral bill that eventually is now law by the president so it's towards having a free fair and credible elections that necessitated mm -hmm. the push for a new electoral act yeah that's that's actually it and one thing we need to know first off mm -hmm. you know what does this bill entail what are the updates to this bill that makes it better than you know the 2020 well election. one of the major things that have uh, has been introduced is the electronic database for voters that's um, something that we are doing so on the um, one of the sections it does allow for INEC to have a central database of all the voters it also allows them to keep this um, data not just in its central office mm -hmm. but across um, all its branches. Another great thing it's done, it's allowed um, INEC to have greater control of its funding. So rather than have their funding approved by the Minister of Finance before it got to them, now they're in full control of that. Yeah. So this now has kind of like translated to how they're able to roll out uh, materials. I mean, just imagine if they needed to talk to the Minister of Finance, mm. Abex, you know, my God, like release funds. We, 
And if the minister has an agenda in any way, he can delay that, and you can see how that could help or you know, be a disadvantage to a party. So that was one of the, one of the things. Another thing was it cleared up um, this issue of overvoting. Mm. This is uh, something it's done. So now overvoting under this new act is basically saying if there are more votes which come from a particular center and it doesn't tally with the actual voters that have been registered from that center, it's now within INEC to, you know, more or less strike it out. Yeah. And the issue with the previous act was you couldn't do that under, um, INEC couldn't do that. You needed to go to the election tribunal for that yeah. to be sorted. And it to be a long process. And that is a way yeah. um, longer, longer process. Another thing they've done was to try and introduce timelines as to where you can conduct primaries. I think we were, it was very well publicized, you know, yeah. um, the deadline, or oh, this was the deadline for primaries, and you, it needs to be done 180 days before an election. You need to wrap it up. Um, that's it. That's one of the new things we've done. Also, in addition to just timelines, there is a provision which does um, put into place a the need for an election notice. Yeah. So you need to have an election notice. The commission needs to put out an election notice. 360 days. Yeah, which is it has done. Actually. Yeah, those are some of the new uh, additions that this um, bill has done. So most notably the funding, the electronic database, the timelines, those are some of the new things this. Yeah, so particularly, Mr. Victor, which which provision would you say particularly took your interest or is of interest to you most? Which of the improvements? Well, there are quite a number of them. Uh, Any way you look at it, they are when you are an aggregate of all of the provisions, all the, some of the new provisions of the Act can only strengthen our democratic process and deepen our democracy. So when you look at, for instance, the issue of electronic transmission of results, before now, we usually have issues where from the polling unit, somebody will take 30 days walking from mm. Kano to bring results to Abuja here, and you ask yourself, is he using a camel or is he using a bicycle to get to Abuja exactly. for the results? But right now, with uh, INEC getting the go-ahead electronically transmission of results, so all you need, even if there is a manual collection of results, then electronically sent right from there to INEC database, in Abuja here, so they have the results while you also have it at the pulling unit. And even if you go to court, like in 19, uh, 2019 and 2015, there were issues bordering on the uh, use of the smart card. And yeah. uh, by then, uh, INEC provided by their directives, guidelines, that you can use it. But the Electoral Act never made provision for it. And some, el some of the election, election results we are counseled at the Supreme Court on the strength that it was not provided for in the Electoral Act, that the Electoral Act supersedes INEC guidelines. Right now, those have been taken care of. So once that is done, you are sure that the results that have been electronically declared or transmitted will be the same thing you are going to get. Yeah. So that is one good thing. Then you also have the provision where before it is based on the number of people registered at a particular polling unit that determine whether uh, there will be a runoff in conclusive elections but right now they are going to look at the number of pvcs accredited voters mm. on that particular day you might have one million people registered in this for instance this is a polling unit yes. you have one million people registered and then on the day of the election you have probably 100,000 people coming out. And at the end of the day, they say, oh, the margin between those who voted and the outstanding is 900,000. So it's inconclusive. Yes. Because the margin of victory, there is still much. Yeah. But now it will not be based on how many people we are credited, not how many people we are registered. Okay. And then, of course, the PVCs, those who we are, those who we are credited and those who voted. So these are measure of improvement that is going to impact positively on the electoral process. So I think uh, for a number of persons, is a good development 
that you don't need to worry. Yes, we may not be where we want to be, but certainly we are not where we used to be. So there's a little bit of progress. Uh, people are they're expecting that probably we come to a point where you just walk in any day you like, do your own voting, go away. We don't need to declare public holiday. Uh, people like Ghana, let us not cite outside the country. Mm -hmm. Within Africa, you still have countries that do it. At least we can use our next door neighbors like Ghana. Of course. You can just walk in, vote, and go to your place of work and do some other things. So these are some of the provisions. And like he mentioned, the issue of fair funding is very critical for INEC. Now they are going to get their money first line charge, which means just like the way you release money to National Assembly, they take care of themselves, judiciary, they take care of themselves. You also release money to INEC one year before the election so they can properly plan what they want to do, what they need, mm -hmm. and then sort themselves out that you don't have to move from from the pres from uh, the INEC office to the presidency. Well, it looks as if once the executive have an influence on the money you get, invariably the tendency to compromise is there. Even if you think there could be something behind the door or behind the scene being played out, but now you cannot make Nigerians think that your hands are tied because yes. you have everything you want. So well ahead of time, ahead of time, so you have opportunity to plan. So I think those are some of the provisions that will help INEC and of course by implication also help Nigeria generally going forward deep in our democracy. Thank you so much. Like, talking about <laughs> the whole provisions of this Electoral Act and everything, Nigerians still have mixed reactions mm, to, to the bill. regards to the act. act. Yeah, it's now an act. With regards to the act, like, even the president, if you notice, was a bit skeptical before he could sign it, the whole push and everything. They've been dragging this thing for couple of months or even years yes, before he finally agreed to sign it. And then we and we also found out that a court in the southeast had um, issues when the bill was signed mm -hmm. into act. Yes. And now um, the director of Enough is Enough, Mr. Yemi Ademilokun, he is saying that it's a good thing actually. It's a uh, progress compared to where we were before. But having law on paper, in quotes, having law on paper is not enough to guarantee credible elections, especially when you look at it that electronics are things that still need to be controlled by human beings. Mm. And human beings are imperfect. And he also made mention of there, are every, there is every possibility that INEC could still have some logistic problems. What do you have to say to this reaction? Well, uh, like they say, the who does not make the monk. Uh, whether you like it or not, the laws are there. Yes, on paper, fine. Some of them wonderful. But then these laws will be implemented by man. Uh, just like we had with the Great Wall of China. When the Chinese were building the Great Wall, the assumption was with this Great Wall, uh, the Mongolians would invade China. It would not be possible for them to invade China. But in the course, within the time they did that, the Mongolians invaded China three times, mm -hmm. despite the Great Wall of China that they felt was impregnable. Why? Because those walls were being manned by man. Exactly. And of course, what they did was to compromise the people who were manning the gates and enter through the gates without bothering to climb the gates. They thought was they would climb the gates and they felt with this kind of skyscraper we have here as a wall, it would be impossible for any man to, to climb, climb over and come in. But what they did was simply to compromise those man in the gates and to just look elsewhere and they passed. Hmm. So the Chinese now realized that what we needed to do was character reformation beyond the infrastructural uh, reformation we are doing. So what am I trying to say? The import of that is that whether we like it or not, there will still be one or two glitches here and there. Even if we just want to uh, take it from a very simple perspective. If you go to the Niger Delta, for instance, there are very, very difficult terrains. You pass through the creeks, you have to go through waters by the ice of Bayelsa, you go through that. And if you're an INEC official and you're in a canoe <laughs> going somewhere and somebody said, oh, God, it looks as if uh, this thing, you have to do something. <laughs> Yeah, and these people well. are not even affected by this act. Like they, they are just hey, good, you know, good, you know, consign me. We know nobody they take it, take care of us. You know, they have this 
attitude towards the act. Yeah, but whether you like it or not, a law is a law. Whether you're ignorant of it or not, it's a material. Like you made reference to the president when he was signing the act, made reference to section 8412, uh, which excludes political appointees from standing for, for election or uh, standing as delegates without first of all resigning. Yeah. Uh, then he asked the National Assembly, I will sign this, but I want you to take a second look at this clause 8412 and review it. Well, uh, eventually the National Assembly didn't look at that. They stepped it down and they had an issue themselves. Yes. Clause 848. And clause 848 provided for the without knowing, I don't know how that mistake happened, <laughs> statutory delegates, they excluded themselves, or those who are politically elected, the president, yeah. vice president, the national members of national assembly, governors, elected officers. officers. They excluded themselves, which was a huge number. And when they amended the act and sent to the president for assent, the president said, okay, you didn't do my own, you want me to do your own. You <laughs> know they work like that. And he held back that particular assent, he didn't assent to it. And that was why we had less number of persons voting or standing in as delegates, as delegates during the presidential primaries of some of these political parties. Yeah. So, so these are why there are issues. You look at the whole thing. If it affects you positively, you will love the art. If it affects you negatively, you have your reservation. Yes. And that's exactly why it looks as if there are reservation or let's say mixed feelings towards the art. Some persons felt the National Assembly put themselves inside the laws, inside the act. They were not making the, the laws or the act for Nigerians, but they put themselves, those of them who are privileged making these Perfect. laws, put themselves within the land, looked at it. How does it affect me? So they were only putting and themselves in yeah. so, the situation. Uh, so that was why some persons, if you also look, there was the issue of how should the primaries be conducted yes. when they provided just for direct primaries. And then the party said, no, you don't determine for us how to conduct our primaries. Give us options. You don't tie our hand by saying it has to just be direct primaries we have to have. In direct primaries, we also should have something like a consensus. Mm. And that was agreed finally. So these are some of the issues when you look at it and uh, you understand why mixed feelings greeted it. Even as it is now, some persons have said pretty soon we also go for an amendment of this uh, 2023, even without putting it in, into <laughs> parties. <laughs> but uh, what I would like it or not is uh, something that um, will help. It's yes. better than 20, 2010 Act. Because you also have a situation where now, unlike 2019 election, we had a situation where somebody said he was forced to announce the result under duress. <laughs> he announced the result of one of the senatorial districts in Imo State under duress. And then INEC canceled that election. But the court upturned that verdict of INEC. Mm -hmm. But now INEC has that power to, to now cancel that election in the event of such a thing happening. So these are some of the provisions that it can only get better. Uh, it's just a step at a time. And I believe that this 2022 Act uh, will be undoubtedly improved on what we saw in yes. 2019 so based on 2010 Thank Act. you so much because we're in that period right now and we're looking at a lot of things being implemented already. So let's actually gauge the effectiveness and how strictly this is being followed. For instance, I believe a number of people actually resigned to, you know, vie for some positions. Someone like um, Apavio and a couple of other people as well. So would you say that this, these um, acts, uh, they are actually being followed strictly? For instance, let's look at the um, primaries, the deadline, the deadline set for the primaries and how that deadline was extended after... INEC specifically said a number of times that it will not move that. So would you say that already these plans are in motion or they're still shaky? Well, uh, we just take it from uh, the context that uh, law is made for man, not man for the law. So there will always be room to tweak some of them, even though they are laws, uh, because some persons argued when the Intra-Party uh, intra Advisory Council, IPAC, yeah. was pushing INEC to extend 
the time for submission of uh, conducting of the primaries and even submission of uh, nomination of candidates. candidates. And INEC was saying, we are not going, we are not going to do this. But some persons argue that INEC exists for the political parties. So if they begin to kick against the political parties, so why are they there? But there are those who also say, the law is the law. These laws are there before the political parties. And INEC, at least, we give it to them. Uh, almost over a year now, they pushed out the timetable. This is our timetable for 2023 general elections. So yeah. it is within the powers of the political parties to now plan Around within the, the timetable that you have been given. The timeline has been provided well enough for you. But given the fact that Nigerians being what we are, <laughs> we will always wait for the last minute to do things. We will always want to tweak something we always want to bend it to suit us. We always want to do it. We are the party in power. We have the control. So we, something must happen. So I wouldn't say right now is being strictly followed, but there is a little a measure of uh, adherence to the provision of that. Because even when INEC now extended by one week the room to conduct their uh, primaries. primaries, they also adjusted their timetable the election was supposed to be February 18, adjusted to 25th. Yes. The governorship and the state house of assembly were also adjusted to March 11. 11. So accommodating that, and they had to do this because even when you are supposed to start campaigns, all these things are factored because now the campaigns will start about September uh, for the presidential and national assembly elections. So why that of the governorship and state house of assembly elections will be in October? So if you don't do this, you make it easy for those who are going to go to court. They'll just look at the provisions and said, INEC acted beyond their window or beyond their powers. Or they ceded the windows that they provided for. You said 150 days One. before this, and now you have reduced it to 130 something days, even if it's 148 days. They can tell you, somebody will say, but what is two days? Does it make a difference? So the party that, that you have to act backing them on that, on that end it is not it's just that INEC just wanted to be flexible so that uh, it doesn't look as if they are working against the interests of any political party and whether you like it or not these persons were appointed by people let's talk about that flexibility because i feel like this guy will have mm. something to say as well because when it comes to that flexibility he's talking about mm -hmm. do you think that flexibility you know can work against INEC you know and their that independence was, as that they was something i was going to actually bring up because from my perspective if you set a deadline you abide by it the reason and you'll hear this a lot the reason you do things like this optics legitimacy if I say my yes is my yes and my no is my no then I look more credible mm. I neck extending this deadline due to whatever powers that may be whatever pressures that may be, would always affect how credible they look. Now, where if that in turn, you know, goes into how the election itself is conducted, we do not know. But if you tell me that it was possible for you to set a deadline and then for you to not abide by it, and like, you know, our guest was saying, they had all the time. Parties had a lot of time. This timetable has been out for a very long time. They had all the time to plan. In fact, I remember um, the, the, the chairman of, uh, of IPAC actually at one point was giving like, some speech on why they should extend the deadline. And he came on to say, oh, there was the Lent which happened. Yeah, there, the was the, there, was a, there was a Muslim fast as well that happened. And this affected how you know, they were able to conduct things within parties and how this was going to affect um, the primaries. And I thought to myself, well, you kind of knew when Lent was going to happen. Mm. You kind of knew when the Muslim fast was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You people have calendars. You people have people. In fact, you have people working so you don't have to think about calendars. Yeah. And these people, that's their job. And then you're telling me that all of a sudden this sprung up on you and then it affected whatever be logistics affected so my point is flexibility is is good i think it's good to adapt to a situation and i would say it's good to adapt to a situation that you didn't plan for something that 
just comes up. Yeah. If there was some emergency that affected us as a country, and then everybody had to be on pause, and then the primaries had to be pushed, we, we, we fully understand that. But it's a situation where some parties have, it looks like they have liberty mm. to dictate what they can do. And I'm sorry, no matter how that looks, it does affect credibility mm. of the commission. Like, I applaud the flexibility of it all. I applaud the planning. I applaud the fact that you tweak it there. But you know the popular saying, prevention is better than cure. You could have prevented this if you... And that's the thing. When he was saying, oh, somebody can take it to court. If I next set a deadline, and then you miss the deadline, and they don't allow your candidate in, and this is taken to court, there is an act. Yeah. <laughs> Based on what we know now, the act supersedes... Anybody. You know, even the commission. That is a point he alluded to. The act supersedes the, even the commission. But if you go against the act, then there's definitely a way you can stick to it. Then we know, as a commission, there's credibility. Then we know for the elections, it gives people this thing where, well, okay, this may be slightly different yeah. than what we've seen before. But be that as it may, the whole flexibility thing does create this bit of, are we going to same old, same old practices? Like the yeah. So that's where I'm coming from. I understand the flexibility, the need for it. I understand in anything, flexibility is important for your survival. But in a situation that could have been prevented, a situation that didn't need to happen, especially something that was planned for well, well ahead of time. You keep mentioning that because it's actually true. Well, well, well ahead. ahead of time. Well, like these things are in the date from the first time in the year. And just based off like the evidence you're getting from the from the moment January one, they're about you can get okay, this is when this is coming in, this is when this holiday comes in, this is when this period comes in. And to use that as an excuse to force the commission to make room that okay. let's let's look at it from this context. Okay. Why I am not uh, hundred percent throwing my weight behind that decision to shift. Mm -hmm. But the challenge there was you had discordant tunes. PDP was saying, oh, you are trying to shift because of APC. Mm. Then IPAC, which supposedly represents all mm -hmm. the political parties, we are saying we are speaking on behalf of the political parties. Now, INEC was put a little bit under pressure. Don't rule out, whether you like it or not, we are still in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Don't rule out the fact that what we say in literature, every writer is a writer in politics. Irrespective of who is the man in charge, there is somebody who presses your mumu button. <laughs> whether you like mm -hmm. it or not, that somebody, once he calls you, you will adjust. Mm. You so, may not so. explain to others. So, there will um, be a little bit of adjustment here and there. Talking about the IPAC, APC, PDP, I mean, PDP is one of the most popular, if not the second popular and second in command party, political party in yeah, Nigeria. Yeah. So if PDP can come out and say, you're not doing this for us, you're doing it because of APC, I think it simply means, the whole thing, it simply means IPAC, is supporting APC because a Labour Party didn't shift their primaries, did they? No. So uh, there's there's talking about flexibility now and saying um, there's always somebody who presses another person's mm -hmm. button. button. <laughs> are you? Are, I feel we are having reasons to be scared, to be worried about the independence, of, independence INEC. of INEC. I wouldn't, I would, you shouldn't be scared because INEC has also acted against the ruling party. Don't forget, after the 2019 elections, APC supposedly won Zamfara, but they lost out. Why? Because they conducted their primaries outside the window provided by INEC. That was how PDP Matawale, Belo Matawale became the governor 
of uh, the second person in that gubernatorial election became the governor of Zamfara mm -hmm. State, even though he has defected to the APC. But the point there is they have also hit hard on the APC. So River State, don't forget, had no had no candidates mm. in 2019 election yes. as a result of similar incidents like this. So there are times when, in this case, they can argue, they can argue that all the political parties were present, that they adjust it a little. But when they have said, like now they've given 17th as the deadline for submission, nomination of candidates, so you are expected by 17th to submit the name of your presidential candidate, his device to INEC, and you don't do that. You've automatically disqualified yourself. Mm. They may not say anything. If they also say these primaries, like they said, adjusted and said, all primaries must be concluded or not before 9th Nine. of June. Mm. If you don't conduct your primaries within this window, you conduct on the 10th. You've also disqualified yourself. It becomes null and void. So they can argue, even though it looks as if it's standing on the premise of uh, flexibility, yeah. but they can argue that the pressure from the political parties made them to adjust, not because they are looking at favoring any political party or the party in power. Whatever it is, you can always have a reason to justify whatever action you take, mm -hmm. because uh, there are two sides to every story. And that's exactly what, for me, I just wanted to play safe before APC accuses mm -hmm. us of uh, <laughs> pandering to the wishes of the uh, PDP party. or other political parties. Okay. Okay. So while we've been talking a lot about the political parties and people in power, how about the people on the other end who are the electorates? Now, like I said, we're drawing closer to the election period and people need to know who to vote. Do you have an idea? People have their ideas. Some people have an idea of who to vote or the candidates to look out for, but some do not. So I'm going to throw this to you first. What are the pointers you think a person should look out for in a potential candidate when you know looking for someone to vote? Your question is relative. Okay. Because How so? it depends on the individual. So for me, I might say I'm looking for competence. Okay. I'm looking for somebody who is inclusive in terms of his perspective to issues, in terms of uh, carrying everybody along, in terms of his uh, vision about the country, mm. and in terms of his uh, total worldview. But there are those who also tell you ethnicity and mm. faith We're going to come to are that key time, yeah. for me. So, for leadership that works, you will look at somebody's antecedents. Where is the person coming from? What has he done in either the small offices he has occupied, whether in the private or public space? What has he been able to do? And what are his views on national issues? There are quite a number of issues on a daily and consistent basis. Yes. How does he get involved? Are his views controversial? Mm. Are his views bias are his views sentimental are his views parochial or is is it somebody who is a bigot or is somebody who is a chauvinist hmm. so these are the things you look at and then say ordinarily in civilized crimes this is what they look out for but in our own crime sincerely speaking i'm a practical realist i tell you how it is in our own crime, dominant issues most times is ethnicity and religion. So long as the person comes from the part of the world where I come from, I'm cool with him, even if he's a good. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is an interesting conversation because that's what's happening exactly like right now because all the presidential candidates were waiting on them to actually pick their VP. And then there's this discussion about having oh, a Muslim Muslim ticket or a Muslim Christian ticket yeah. or basically religion and zoning is coming into the mix. So you're saying that you don't think zoning is important, something like zoning and religion when it comes to the selection of a candidate? Ordinarily, it shouldn't be. Okay. But in the Nigeria of today, 
we are a multiracial, a heterogeneous society. So you cannot feign ignorance of these facts. Uh, a French philosopher, Bart Camus, he once said that uh, he's only a kind of spiritual snobbery that makes people think they can be happy without money. So it will also be foolhardy for anybody to think that in Nigeria it doesn't matter. We must be sensitive to the fact that this country is a complex country. You have so many national, ethnic nationalities and you cannot pretend about it. More so, when there seems to be overt, overt insult on the sensibilities of Nigerians in a number of ways. So, there have been all kinds of insinuations, all kinds of comments. So, mm. people have all kinds of ideas running in their brain. So, if you think you want to run a Christian Christian ticket, you want to run a Muslim Muslim ticket, and you are not sensitive to this, or you don't care about zoning, you will not be doing yourself one any good and you also not be doing the country any good. There is no pretense about it. Look at Nigeria. It's only proper. When we are fashioning the, when the country was thinking along the line of the six geopolitical zones, and even the PDP went as far as enshrining it into their own constitution, the issue of rotation, yes. they recognize the fact that, only to be fair, in most civilized, in most countries, they are deliberate about it. There are some countries that are deliberate their national assembly, they are deliberate about it, the number of women that should be in the parliament. In some countries that also have a similar structure like us, they are deliberate. Christians, we have this number. Muslims, we have this number. Traditionalists, we have this number. These people, they are deliberate about it to preserve everybody's uh, integrity, so to say, and everybody's uh, uh, feelings that we are part of this project. But when there is a dominance, of one particular tribe or one particular religion, religion, there will be tension. And the Nigeria of today, we don't need that. We must be sensitive. The politicians, what matters for them is interest. Mm. They can converse for anything, so long as their interest is served. But for us, many a times, you ask yourself, the fact that Buhari comes from Castina State, maybe if you go to his village, you Daura, Maybe you might be shocked. It's not everybody that is enjoying life. Mm. So how has it impacted on your life? There could be somebody from an entirely different zone that could turn around the fortunes of that particular zone. Jonathan was building imaginary schools mm. for people in the north mm. to the point that it was like, ah, you're obsessed with this thing. So how many has the president who is from the north built? So these are some of the issues, whether we like it or not, we must be sensitive to the heterogeneous nature of our country, the, the plurality of the country, and the fact that we are also a secular nation. If yeah. you lose sight of those things, you will not be helping the country, not just yourself. But you will not be great. My co host is about to come in on that one. I just talk to me, you know. If Jonathan is from the south yes. and he's doing something for the north and the president who is from the north, in quote, is not doing anything for the north, I think it simply means that it's not all about zoning. I don't know if you get where I'm coming yeah. from. It's all about who the person is and not where he's coming from. Because like you just said, this man is from the south and he has done so much. He has taken a lot of children from the streets. And this man on seat now is from this north. He sees, he has seen, he has witnessed how these children roam the streets. How people suffer, the famine and everything. You get beggars everywhere and in quotes. He's not doing anything in particular about this thing. What would you say about that? Looking at all these things, what would you say about it, putting zoning into consideration? All right, like I said, ordinarily, you would say zoning should be a central factor in deciding who becomes our leader 
or those who should lead us. But we are not in normal times. And we are not a country that you can say we are monolithic. That is talking about being one. Yeah. And we are not countries like Malaysia, where you are first identified as a Malaysian before the tribe where you come from. Nigeria, you are first an Igbo man, a Hausa man, a Do man, a Calabar man. Before that is what you are first before you are a Nigerian. You are first a Muslim before you are a Christian. You commit a crime, your religion and your name determines whether you are guilty or not. It is not about this crime, you committed it or not. Once you get to the station, what's your name? <laughs> Shegun. Mm. It determines whether you are guilty or not. What's your name? Mohammed. It determines whether to be, to, you should be freed or not. So if you live in a country like this, will you feign ignorance to the fact that we are a very polarized nation? And then you do things without considering the fact that we have to make these ones feel, have a sense of belonging. Mm. You can't. So this is why we must factor zoning and make others feel factor zoning, factor fit in whatever we do. Forget the argument that, oh, we need comp Yes, undoubtedly, competence. But should competence only stop with uh, when it comes to politics? No. 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 Federal character, why did we come up with Federal Character Commission? Mm. Why are we talking way. about people being educationally disadvantaged? Mm. If we are talking about people being educationally disadvantaged, ordinarily, you would expect that those who are disadvantaged should be behind. Yes. And those who are advantaged should be in front. Mm. But is it not our irony that those who are disadvantaged are in front mm. and those who are advantaged are behind? Mm. How do you explain the situation? Two kids from Queen's College sit <laughs> for the same exam, jump. The same teacher taught them, the same <laughs> Queen's College, the same Lagos environment, they sit for exam. Because this one is from Anambra State, his score is 350 over 100. And this one is from Zamfara State, his score is 10 over 400. How okay. do you explain that? Okay. 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 What, what he's saying is, is really something I, like, just to go off and when young people in particular have a conversation on everything elections and everything that has to do with you know where we're heading and um, I'm, I'm going to try and say this directly to the camera but <laughs> no it's true but there's no way we are going to change anything if we don't admit the reality of where we are mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the issue that I do have when a lot of us speak on certain topics like this particularly is because we have not accepted what's on ground mm -hmm. us accepting it does not mean we're going to keep Stay the status way. quo mm -hmm. yeah. but undoubtedly if we are going to change things and this is a personal opinion mm. you can share something very different i'm not trying to convince you i'm trying to appeal to you two different things mm. we need to understand the system before we can break it down and we need to first of all unfortunately and i use the word unfortunately kind of enter the system before we can then kind of build it up and you know bring it down and then bring it back up yeah. and because he's said so many things that it's right you cannot deny the fact that we are we're not one thing and a lot of countries where you see that they do this you know based on maybe just competence alone they are their society has gone so far yes <laughs> that now they're one thing but one thing we fail to realize is history and I think that's something we need to get a grasp of. Not just history of like everywhere else, but our own history. Mm. And understanding that how business particularly functions, even us getting independence, was based on, you know, this whole thing of trying to appease everybody. Yes. This history though. Exactly. No, no. <laughs> and, and this is another thing. And it's so true. The people who are running this country or the people who are in charge of overseeing this country were not Nigerians. First. Yes. yes. There were other things first. In fact, just by age, they are older than the country. By far. So in their lifetime, Nigeria was just a concept introduced to them. So they are basically handling a concept. <laughs> we want them to handle a country. The reason why we want them to handle a country is because we are born into the country of first Nigerians. Yes. So Going back to this thing about zoning, I think it's just very important that I think young people kind of understand everything he says and just try and break it down and digest the, the way he navigated it. We want competence, but 
be very realistic of the environment that we're in. I think yeah. that is, is just one super thing. And if I'm going to add and just put it on to, to our guest is um, but the new act has obviously brought in like, you know, the fact that we need electronic, you know, voting and, yeah. you know, they're trying to digitize the, the, the process. process. Yeah. So, and you said there are basically logistic mm -hmm. issues. But like, do you think we are in a good position to handle the issues that may come with trying to digitize this this process? Because I remember when we were talking about people basically needing like a, sh a boat to go to certain places, and it's true. To get to my mother's hometown, you can't get there via car. You need <laughs> a boat. You actually do. You really do. She never makes me forget it, <laughs> but you really do. So that is something that people need to consider and i'm just so do you think we are ready like um for this especially in a time where we're calling for internet voting and people in diaspora are calling to be able to, to vote. vote well we may not be there right now but it shouldn't stop us from taking a walk trying something you know what they say about room not be built in a day mm. yeah so we just have to start uh from somewhere and begin to make progress because if you don't start that is the greatest tragedy mm. but when you start there could be hiccups along the line you are recognizing the hiccups and you can learn to correct some of the uh, hiccups that you meet along the way so why do i say that recognizing the fact that even if you take for instance the continuous voter registration that is ongoing many a time the beavers takes more than by their own estimation it shouldn't take more than two minutes to register somebody. So, but is it what is on ground? Many a times there are <laughs> little, little issues that come up. There are glitches. You discover that one person is taking almost 30 minutes. Mm. Network. Network issues. No light. And then, so if you recognize these things, you know that it's also going to have a little bit of impact on the elections because you can have somebody who will come and you take more than the necessary time to accredit that person. And this time around, during the course of this, based on the new electoral act, there won't be no incident form. If it's not working, it's not working. That simply means two options. Either the next day the election will continue the next day, so that the, quote unquote, the beavers can be applied. But if it doesn't work, that simply means that area, no voting took place. So, by default, some persons might be disqualified, disenfranchised rather, during the elections. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a good way to start going electronic. It's a good way to start. If there is nothing, at least, mm -hmm. the ones that are successful, the results can be electronically transmitted. If you recall 2019 or even 2015, when we, we have some, INEC was announcing results, 2015, yeah. on that Jaga, you hear, oh, we are still waiting for uh, people from Kano, the wreck from Jigawa, to come, and you are asking, how? Is it too difficult? Somebody from Nasarawa, we are still waiting for them. <laughs> so now that we know that these results will be transmitted electronically, even some of the elections that INEC had conducted, after off-cycle elections they've conducted. Yeah. You won't see situations where you just see the results. You see results, but you can't announce the result. The result has to be announced by an accredited INEC official return officer, as the case may be. Yeah. But you will see the results. So in a pooling unit, so as the results are coming, they've been uploaded on our website, uh, INEC's website, and you are seeing it. So those things are also good for us. But if we begin to look at some of the drawbacks of power issue, network issue, because we still, in terms of network penetration and all that, we are not yet there. But we continue to trudge on, we continue to push, we cannot be held back, because if we begin to analyze it, we will end up in what is called paralysis of analysis. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we need that. We just have to move on, recognize those things will be there, Recognize there will be a little bit of shortcomings here and there, but then still optimistic that if we don't get it this time around, there will be an improvement next time. Next time. There will be an improvement next time. So 
AKT and Oshun provides INEC with an opportunity to experiment all that they've said and all the provisions of the Electoral Act before 2023. Yeah, so talking about improvements, now besides dropping the electoral bill aside, the act aside, when you look at this current period and past electoral periods, would you say this is any different? Are you seeing a shift, agitations, anything different from the past electoral period, pre-electoral period? It will, normally, you, you, have the same, you have the same scenario. These are politicians, and some of them have been in this game since 1960. They are mm. still here. Some of them 1970, some of 1980. So you don't expect them to change anything pretty soon. Now, how about the participation? Yes, participation, if you look at what is currently happening, yeah. there seems to be an awakening. And mm. that awakening, for me, I can see it from the context that people are beginning to think, since we've been promised there's going to be a lot of electronic, uh, electronic involvement, yeah. that their votes Will can count. count. So because of that, many are turning out to register, believing, and they, are, they now also think that there is an alternative, as against when they always feel that it's the same of the same. Yeah. They don't need to bother themselves. But now, there seems to be an alternative for the people. So those who think in that direction, who may not have even registered before, there are some who have never voted before, there are some who may not have registered before, everybody is now going out. So there is this consciousness, this mass movement. And at times you need things like that. You need somebody that comes and then just turns everywhere around like a revolution. And everybody is out there doing things that ordinarily they wouldn't think they would do. And it helps the system, praying that the umpires themselves will also be measurably unbiased and remain neutral umpires. If that happens, with this level of turnout, Nigerian elections had always hovered around 30, 35 yes. percent participation. So voter party. Been, voter party, low turnout of voters, every election, whether general, whether off cycle elections. But what we are seeing presently, if we use the continual voter registration as anything and extrapolate, you can begin to think that maybe we might have an improvement in terms of voter turnout, given that a lot of persons are coming out. And I don't want to believe that. Uh, majority are just coming out to just go and collect PVC for business transactions or mm, for ID cards to go identification, to places yeah. for identification purposes. I want to believe, based on my interaction with some persons and uh, some of the things I read up, you see that a lot of persons are eager to be part of the electoral process because they feel there is options open for them now people they can say okay we've not tried these people before yeah. or these people are not part of those who have put us here whether wrongly or rightly. rightly but that is the impression that is the general feeling for most of the people coming out now at least maybe between 70 80 percent of those who are trooping out is born out of the fact that we've seen these ones but these ones we've not seen mm. let's see whether we can try these ones and that is why i would want to believe there is a measure, there is a measure of difference in what we used to know and what it is now. So I just pray that it continues that way because in politics, that's what we uh, do a lot, pray. In politics, one month is a long time. Yes, yeah. so even much, a day is a so long much time. Can change uh, going ahead. But let's believe that uh, the political parties, especially these ones, that seem to be enjoying a measure of momentum now mm. Mm. can hold on to it and continue to ride on that wave, continue to convince the people to stay with them as against whatever might happen. Maybe we might enjoy 2023 elections, if not uh, the way we want it, but it Better may give us a measure one. of hope to say there is hope uh, ahead of us. Everybody get a PVC. <laughs> <laughs> See, long story short, just no, don't worry. Sure. Let's get your PVC. You know what, Patrick? I, I think it's not get your PVC now. Is I know some people that have registered but left the PVC in that office. Mm. I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so don't just go register. 
get it don't just get it and leave it in your house make use of it mm. Yeah, so nice way to take a shot at somebody in this in this I'm area. Not, I'm just but saying. yes, don't uh, just register. Go get your PVC and actually come out because there are different processes. You can yeah. get your PVC and put it in your purse or your wallet forever, and you would not even turn out to vote. Some yeah. people don't even collect their PVC. That is important. Please get your PVC. So I was asking about you know the difference in you know this election and um, the past election. Mm -hmm. There's one other thing I wanted us to talk about, and I feel like I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you were going to ask, is there a difference? a difference? Do we see a progress compared to yes. other elections? So, and, and I know you said that there's a difference, but to me, and you know, I'm asking you, it seems a lot like what we saw, you know, when um, the PDP garnered um, over 11 million votes then you know there was a push there was this campaign on twitter yeah. it was all for you know Atiku. Atiku. you know Atiku people were, were bent on you know having the party in power you know out, out. of office so it doesn't doesn't it seem similar to you you know because there's always this agitation leading up to that moment well there will always be that uh because you take advantage of any opportunity that presents itself to push for your candidate yeah. or to uh, try to woo and convince Nigerians, I am the best candidate for you. Uh, so we, we are going to see a lot of that, especially when the campaigns officially kicks off. Even as it is now, you can see what is happening. So you are guess as good as mine, what is likely to happen when the campaigns kick off in September and October. So, mm. Uh, but generally, I don't expect anything less. It's going to be more intense more. because of the people involved, especially mm. from the major two leading political parties. It's yeah. going to be intense. And then you are also going to have uh, ignore me or underrate me at your peril mm. coming from two other political parties. Underdogs. Underdogs. Mm -hmm. That you ignore them at your own peril because there are influences they are going to weigh that you may not think they would have. For instance, if we go to a place like Kano, for instance, Kano is usually a place everybody, everyone contesting the presidential election want to win yes. because you assume they have how many million Population. votes are coming. But now, Kano is polarized along APC, NNPP, as a matter of fact. Yes. Mm. You can say NNPP is the leading party in Kano. Kano. Yes, yes, they don't have, uh, they are not in power. But having two governors who have served twice, two terms, in one party, and knowing that these people have great influence, it's mm. not that they are just past the governors. Mm. They are people who also command a large followership in that state. You understand why I say Kano for now is under serious threat. It's not something you can say, we are sure. Because we are in power, we are sure. Yes. It's not, you can imagine what made the governor to drop his central ambition. Because the guy who was there was threatening to leave and he mm. knew where he was going to go. So he had to sacrifice his own ambition for the guy to stay at least so that he can also have some people stay mm. with him. So you still have the PDP. There are still remnants with PDP in Kano State. So between NNPP, APC, PDP, mm. there is trouble. So will you underrate such a party mm. in that state? The answer is no. Mm. And it's not just in Kano that NNPP is strong. Between Kano, Kaduna, Kastina, they are strong. Okay. So, when you look at all of this, even Jigawa, because Kano is an offshoot of uh, Jigawa yes. before. So, Wakwansu is very strong along this axis. Now, if APC is also counting on their influence in these areas, so you can now understand that the number of votes they are likely to garner will be shared, except something drastic happens. Like a merger? Mm. Well, a merger now... Do you foresee one? Uh, 
maybe that will be unofficial because I don't think there is room for that now, <laughs> given the time, except unofficial. Okay. You know, we've always had situations. I remember in those days, uh, our Progressive Grand Alliance will tell you, we are not feeding a presidential candidate, we are supporting good news. Mm, exactly. So, except something like that happens, some mm. of the parties say, okay, we are not feeding a candidate here, we are aligning with this, pet, this party A or party B, that's who we are aligning with. But outside that, it's going to be pretty tough. That's why I said, you ignore some parties at your peril. Some people will be dismissing them now. Ah, do they have this? Do they have this? But let's see how it goes. The momentum is strong. The wave, the, the, the level of defection to some of these parties are growing by the day. And it's not something you dismiss. Of course, I know that Nigeria, money politics in Nigeria is something else. Mm. Money is going to talk. And as a how matter of fact, in the 80s, there was a, a one top socialite from the Delta Edo Aziz. How he was described then is that when he sprays in parties, Naira loses value. Wow. So <laughs> this time around, these politicians, by the time they come out, our Naira will lose value tremendously. <laughs> Please. That, that means Naira is going to be equal to zero <laughs> no, right no, now. Right we now. Say it doesn't. Okay. Right no, now. It doesn't. That is not what we want. <laughs> and I know you mentioned a couple of underdogs. Um, there's this thing that is happening now about um, one one of the certain parties, which is Labour Party. And you know, when I talked about it, it's even you know in the news, people are talking about a merger between um, NNPP. 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 Thank you and LP. Do you think? that those two if it happens have the weight in that uh, the weight that is enough to go against um the party in power and you know the opposition pdp well for the sake of argument mm. uh, for the sake of argument if it happens it will be a difficult one for the pdp and the apc mm. but i can't say is enough to guarantee that they win. But it's going to be a tough call mm. if they do that. But also, in reality, I, I, will, I will be a little bit uh, pessimistic to say that they will agree to work together. together. Mm. I will be a little bit pessimistic about that. Why? Work and so for some time has also been nursing the ambition. The ambition. I uh, remember he contested against President Buhari during the ACM primaries and the APC primaries. So I don't see him also just saying, okay, let me sacrifice my ambition again after leaving the PDP, forming this party, and then uh, say, I don't see that. Obi himself as well, uh, if, he left the Labour, if he left the People's Democratic Party because he wants to realize the ambition mm -hmm. of being president, mm. I also find it difficult to think that he will say, okay, let me align two. with NNPP and probably take a back seat. But again, Nigerian politicians <laughs> can't can say. Because somebody tells you this morning, I'm yet to make up my mind. Mm. The yes. next morning, you will hear him and justify why he's running. Mm. And you ask yourself, so when did you make up your mind? <laughs> so anything is still possible with Nigerian politicians. Okay, so just finally, we're seeing a push, you know, just like we're saying, get your PVC, we're seeing a push by different people in their little mites. There's this video that went vir um, viral of a priest, you know, stopping the congregation from entering without their PVC. How do you feel about that action? Straight up, that is not proper. It is within their fundamental rights to register or not to register mm. yes as a patriotic citizen yes, it's part responsibility. of your civic responsibility especially if you are 18 and above to be part of the democratic process or to register but that you didn't register or you don't have a pvc what is the correlation Religion. between your registration and your faith mm. this is you and Religion, as a matter of fact, is a personal thing yes. between you and God. And that is why at times there are things we do that should not ordinarily happen. 
It's just like when government pay money for people to go on a pilgrimage. Mm. What for? That is, serving God is a personal relationship. So it's not something about the state. So I think it's wrong uh, for the priest or any pastor to do that. But having said that again, it also underscores the importance or the seriousness people are attaching to the forthcoming elections. elections. So they don't want people to be different. And you know, if there are people uh, who can be very indifferent, it is attachment, let me say, faith-based people. Because let me not say A or B, uh, <laughs> but faith-based. When we carry it, faith-based, I'm this, I am that. Yes. We can be different. You know, consign me. I have my, this thing with my God. I yeah. have this, so you don't, you don't bother. But you forget, when you let, quote and unquote, the wrong ones mm. get on the saddle, mm. they make laws that can even stop you from that your religion. Religion, yes. exactly. What will you do? We had a time when uh, they said no gathering of more than 50. At the point, everywhere was closed. Yes. Everywhere was closed. What will you do? And I know, even from every, I don't know, at least the one I know from the Christian faith, they say obey those in authority. Yes. So you can't forcefully go and say, I'm opening this mosque, I'm opening this church. <laughs> Well, why must he stop? I'm going to pray. You can't. So that is why, at times, if also when you hear people say, let the pastors face their destiny, let the mom, let them face their yes. calling. Let the, the, why would they face their calling? They are part of the whole thing. They are part of the system. They are citizens as well. Inflation is biting, is biting them. Inflation now, uh, the inflation results by the MBS, MBS National, National Bureau of Statistics, released yes. today. Uh, inflation for the month of uh, May has shot to 18, has shot to over 18 percent. And that is the highest in 11 years. Mm. That's the highest in 11 years. So when he goes to the market, <laughs> who is he going to tell them I'm a pastor? <laughs> I'm an imam. Sell to me. Forget that thing. No. The diesel that we can buy, we are not seeing that it's short getting to 800 naira a liter. And they are projecting it might get to 1,500 before the end of the year or more. Mm. The fuel queues that is everywhere, Increasing. despite us paying so much for subsidy, right now we've paid over 1.8 trillion naira. This is June. And then the World Bank has projected that we might get up to 5 trillion naira before the end of the year. Will you say, I am not? So he is part, he feels what the society feels. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's a very simple thing no economic progress where there is no political stability. Mm. Yeah. Look at countries that are making progress. They have political stability. If you don't have political stability, you cannot have economic prosperity. So if you deceive yourself by saying, I'm not concerned me, or priests should face You'll their job, the, um, the imam should face their destiny, you'll be making a mistake, and they also will be making a mistake. So I think that is why uh, that priest was trying to make the congregants understand that you need to be serious this time around. Don't be indifferent. Decide. Your destiny is being decided and you cannot be silent when your destiny is being decided. Yeah. So thank you so much for that because we really had to clear that. You know, we, there's a lot of, you know, it's polarized views. Some people are like, oh, yes, they need to do this. While some say democracy in itself is an option. It's a... It's not by force. That's the thing. You, you, you're not supposed to be forced to vote or even to register. It's just a responsibility mm -hmm. and that's it. So, we're rounding this up, guys. Final words. Get your PVC. That's all I have to say. I don't know what these guys have to say. <laughs> still, still, still get your PVC. Like, okay. yeah. uh, 30th of June. That's when it closes, no? Closes at the end of this month? Yeah. Yes. yes. 30th of June. We have about roughly... 14 days, 14 days, 15 days to get to get it done. Do Register, please. In in numbers, go and get your PVC. Yes, and to cap this up, do you know about our app? It's Isesan Speak Asian, the language learning app, an African language learning app. But first of all, for your answer, 
where can you tell us where you're from and the language or languages you speak i'm from the southern eastern part of nigeria precisely from abia state mm. and uh, i speak Igbo. Mm. that's the language i speak okay and wish i could understand other languages <laughs> <laughs> you know what consider is this and speak is and your wish fairy that could grant you your wish okay. all you need to do is go ahead and download the app you know if you're using android it's available on your store or ios it's there on your store you can download it there's hausa there's yoruba there's swahili in case you want to go out whatever to african tribe tree from like. ghana zulu and so many more and you know there's a tradition you need to actually talk to the audience or any one of us in Igbo. say anything you want to say at all no pressure. Okay. Election it election So that ki vote la election that's what a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you heard that one. Actually, no, what? but... You're just waiting to just I get that. You know where it happens sometimes, just waiting. Like, I think it's better than that. you. You know all that English. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you so much for being part of this episode. I want to say thank you. I sound You know what people... Fear women, but that is another topic for another day. You and who? <laughs> <laughs> the one day she's nice to me. <laughs> no, it's, it's one fake. second she's yeah, nice to you. It's like a free trial and then after some time. Because it's gonna be off, off now. with you. I'm sorry. No, I'm not, but it's fine. Okay. I'm so still your social priest. Hard luck, Frederick. <laughs> Frederick. <laughs> yes, and the person I send actual love to. Yeah, Nefisat of Nenabjurahman. And yes, he is not a cherry on top, he was part of the whole He's the main ingredient. Yes, he is. Thank you so much, Mr. Victor, for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure to have you guys. He is a producer and anchor of Situation Report on, like I said, Silverbirds Rhythm FM Abuja. Thank you so much for coming. We hope Thank to have so more much. of you My here pleasure. to discuss important issue. issues like this. <laughs> Please, <laughs> you have just so much to offer. And we can just like give you the um. whole show. But we'll, we'll, see how you, we'll see how it goes. We know you care for us. <laughs> Thank you so much. This Thank is State you. of the Culture brought to you by Easy Stand Speak Ace. And remember, you can interact with us on our social media handles. Mm -hmm. The handle has the same title across all platforms, Izetan Speak Ace. My name is Justina Angiating. I am your host. Thank you for watching and joining us today. Bye. Bye.